I'd like to welcome everybody to the future of earmark transparency. Uh, the booming voice that you'll be hearing for the next hour or so is Daniel Schumann, Policy Counsel with the Sunlight Foundation. I'm also the Director of the Advisory Committee on Transparency. Uh, the Advisory Committee uh, supports the efforts of the Congressional Transparency Caucus to make government more open and transparent. We do so in two ways. First, by providing education and resources to Congressional staff on transparency issues, and also by helping to make connection between staff and experts. There are 18 organizations that are members of the advisory committee, and more information is available on transparencycaucus.org. Now, today's topic is, cleverly enough, the future of earmark transparency, and I am delighted to welcome two experts from the field, Steve Ellis and Jim Harper. Uh, Steve is the vice president of Taxpayers for Common Sense, a nonpartisan budget watchdog focused on making the government spend taxpayer dollars responsibly and to operate within its means. Uh, Steve oversees programs and serves as a leading media and legislative spokesperson. Jim is the Director of Information Policies at the Cato Institute, which is not an acronym, uh, it, but it is a think tank for those focused on the principles of individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and peace. Uh, he is also the man behind the scenes at WashingtonWatch.com. Let me just say it again for Jim's sake, WashingtonWatch.com, uh, which is a website that provides the numbers behind proposed legislation and regulations. Welcome to you both, and also welcome to everybody uh, who is in attendance today. So I'm gonna set the stage just a little bit. Um, just this past Friday, incoming presumptive speaker of the House, and we have to say presumptive, I think, until Wednesday. Uh, incoming presumptive speaker of the House, John Boehner said, quote, Next week, the House Republican Conference, including all of our newly elected members, will vote on a measure that will impose an immediate ban on earmarks at the start of the 112th Congress. And on Saturday, just a day later, President Obama repeated his call for earmark transparency, which he had articulated during his State of the Union address when he said, quote, I'm calling on Congress to publish all earmark requests on a single website before there's a vote. In the 112th Congress, there have been 38 earmark reform bills. The bill that seemed to have made the most progress is called the Earmark Transparency Act, which was introduced by Reps Cassidy and Spears in the House and Senator Coburn in the Senate. And that bill was reported out of the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee by a vote of 11 to 5 in June. Uh, over the last few years, Congress has made repeated efforts to reform the earmark process. In 2007, the House and Senate first imposed an earmark disclosure rule which culminated in 2009 with the requirement that members of the House post earmark requests on their own websites. The House Appropriations Committee imposed a ban on for-profit earmarks in March 2010, and at the same time, the House Republican Conference self-imposed a one-year earmark moratorium. And the Senate uh, rejected imposing a similar moratorium, I think, 29 to 68. So that is uh, sort of our, our introductory framework, and I'm going to do my best to not speak so much so that our experts here uh, can do most of the talking. And I'm going to start with you, Steve. Um, would you talk just a little bit why you think the current rules regarding earmarks are insufficient and the recommendations that you and the coalition of organizations came out with um, to, to reform that process? Sure. Um, as uh, Daniel said, I am Steve Ellis. I'm Vice President of Taxpayers for Common Sense, and we are a national nonpartisan budget watchdog. Um, we've been uh, monitoring earmarks and issues around them almost from our existence. We're in our 15th year, uh, but really heavily databasing um, all the earmarks starting with fiscal year 2004 uh, going forward, providing that information on our website um, uh, in a lovely Excel format. Um, but uh, anyway, so part of the reason, you know, you could look at it is, is that uh, wh why do we, obviously we think it's important because we put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into doing that databasing and um, done a lot of data entry over the years. And uh, why do we think it matters? Well, part of it is, is that even though, you know, you can say that $15.9 billion, which is uh, what we, how we, the total amount of earmarks in the FY10 budget, uh, the 9,499 congressional earmarks that we counted, um, isn't, isn't a huge percentage of a $3.4 trillion federal budget. But as uh, uh, Congressman Obie had pointed out, is that um, it gets a disproportionate amount of attention. Uh, they suck the oxygen out of the room, and he also complained that it turns uh, lawmakers into ATM machines for the congressional districts. And so it's something that lawmakers and lobbyists put a lot of interest in, and so we 
certainly do as well. Also, uh, part of our concerns about why, why this matters is, is that uh, these decisions are being done on the basis of political muscle rather than project merit. And that lawmakers who are in the best position to obtain earmarks, those who are on the Appropriations Committee, those who are in leadership, do disproportionately better. And if you look at, the, for instance, the state of Alaska, the year after uh, when you had Senator Begich there in fiscal year 2009 instead of Senator Stevens, the former chairman of the Appropriations Committee, they lost a huge percentage of their earmarks. It's not because the projects in Alaska were any better in fiscal year 2008 or, any, or in fiscal year 2010 uh, than they were in fiscal year 2000. Um, that they were any better in fiscal year 2009 than they were in fiscal year 2010. It just happened to be that the person asking for them was, was a different lawmaker, and you went from having the former chairman, the former defense appropriations uh, ranking member, to having the only representation being uh, Senator Murkowski, who was a backbencher on the committee. Um, also, part of our concerns is that we don't know why projects get approved or disapproved. It kind of goes into a black box, and we know that lawmakers submit thousands, and Jim and I know this really well, tens of thousands of earmark requests uh, every year. And uh, we don't know why only 9,499 um, in fiscal year 2010 actually made it, over the, made it over the goal line, and the other ones were left on the cutting room floor. In addition, there's almost no feedback loop on earmarks. We don't know um, whether the, widget, the million dollars that we sent to Acme Inc. to buy widgets for the Department of Defense actually got us widgets. Did the widgets work? Um, should we be going with that? Again, is there another contractor? There's no competition. We don't get any of the feedback loop that we do in the, generally in the budget process, which is also another major concern for ours, uh, for us. And then also, in some cases, projects get funded by earmarks, like wood utilization gets millions of dollars every year, year after year. Uh, you would think that uh, considering that we've been utilizing wood basically since uh, you know the beginning of time, that we'd kind of have a little sense of what to do with wood. Um, but anyway, um, and then uh, I did touch on a little bit on one of the other issues is pay to play. And that's been something that is a concern. We've seen some lawmakers uh, trade their pinstripes for prison stripes. And uh, you have uh, definitely cases of where um, um, some, you had uh, the PMA group uh, where you, literally in the, the, when the findings, when Paul Magliacetti, who put the PM and PMA group, uh, when he uh, did the statements of fact, when he, before he went to jail, it was clear that campaign they, did, they gave campaign contributions to curry favor so that they could get more earmarks for their clients, so then they could get more clients and give more contributions. And so essentially, you do have this case of where, whether it's reality or perceived, um, uh, that you have people making thousands of dollars in campaign contributions to get millions of dollars in tax, tax dollars for their earmarks. So Daniel mentioned that uh, we did join with uh, some other organizations, some that were sort of like-minded, like, uh, like ours, with concerns about earmarks, like the Citizens Against Government Waste, um, also uh, Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, and um, uh, Public Citizen on the sort of the public interest side. We talked with, uh, starting in July, with um, some lobby shops, um, particularly uh, um, Jim Walsh, former congressman from upstate New York, former appropriator, former cardinal, uh, and uh, is now with uh, K&L Gates, and Rich Gold, who's with Holland and Knight, and uh, Dave Wenhold, who's the president of the American League of Lobbyists, and with a, another, um, I think it's Miller and Wenhold uh, strategies or something like that, I can't remember exactly. Uh, they were all speaking, just, just to be clear, and for their own benefit on their, for themselves, not for their firms, um, but we decided, well, we had different, they would rather see the system kind of go on pretty much like it was, uh, but recognizing that was not possible, what are some things that we could all agree on that would make it a better system? And since you know our, our interest is the public interest in trying to create a better spending processes, we uh, went ahead and said, all right, well, let's figure out, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, to be clear, we would rather uh, essentially have a moratorium, take that pause to actually put into, a pla put into place more uh, effective spending programs, more merit-based, competitive, and, uh, or, or formula programs for allocating spending. Uh, so these are sort of uh, things that we could all agree on rather than actually what we would want. But um, we basically came down with five principles that everybody agreed to. And uh, one of those principles was uh, the, the earmark transparency legislation that Daniel mentioned. 
Um, it's uh, um, Coburn Gillibrand in the Senate and uh, Cassidy Spear in the House. And uh, essentially, you know, a soup to nuts, cradle to grave information about every earmark request, whether it's in a spending bill or an authorization bill like the highway bill or uh, in a tax bill like the miscellaneous tariffs bill. Uh, information about the, uh, the who this, not just the sponsor or the beneficiary, but also about where is the uh, uh, funding going, how long has the project been funded, what is the uh, uh, what, are the, what is the purpose behind it? What is the federal interest in this? And a, a whole, I think it's like something like 18 uh, different data sets that would be captured or fields that would be captured on every earmark. And this would be administered by the clerk of the house and the secretary of the Senate. Uh, in addition, we supported, uh, and probably the most controversial uh, um, uh, agreement was to try to go after a pay to play and where that you could not direct in the earmark to a, uh, a campaign contributor. And so uh, there would be a de minimis amount that you would be able to contribute. It uh, kind of gets around the idea of any of the speech implications of campaign contributions, because it's not saying you can't contribute. There is there is a, a constitutional right to free speech. Uh, there isn't a constitutional right to get earmarks. And so we went on that side of it rather than on the, uh, the campaign contribution side of it. Uh, also, and staff have been fairly responsive and, and pleased with this. And actually, it was not something that came from our group. It really came more from uh, Public Citizen. And actually, um, Congressman Walsh seemed to be pretty, uh, not didn't like this, but it barred uh, um, congressional staff, legislative staff from uh, attending uh, fundraisers. So you don't have to go to your boss's fundraiser anymore. You can go to the softball game. Um, and then also uh, kind of going on the back end, on the feedback loop and not knowing what we're getting for our, our earmarked dollars, um, having the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, randomly audit uh, earmarks so that we know what, whether we're getting a, a return on our investment or we're getting actually what we're being promised. And there's been some anecdotal information that earmarks don't even necessarily go to uh, the intended beneficiary in some cases or we're not getting what, we're, what we've been promised. And then also, I think from uh, something that captures uh, at least the Appropriations Committee attention, a lot of times some of these... Um, some of the reasons why the agencies go along with the earmarks is because they get to, they get a little uh, kickback. They get to carve a little bit off the top for overhead, and so they, uh, they just. So we were wondering, you know, does a million dollar earmark actually end up with eight hundred fifty thousand dollars and some benefit or some project, and the other hundred fifty thousand dollars go to the go to the agency? And then um, lastly, and this kind of stemmed from some controversies as well that uh, uh, people were directing earmarks to. Uh, friends or to small startups that are happen to be from their former staff that lawmakers would have to certify that they um, that the company had the uh, the capacity and the ability to actually achieve the earmark and so it really you know I mean the, the, per, the lawmaker is probably going to do that is not going to mind certifying that they that it isn't doing that but uh, in reality just one more sort of thing that we can kind of catch uh, people on on that issue and uh, with that, rather than droning on incessantly, um, I will uh, allow you to turn it over to Jim. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have about earmarks. Unfortunately, um, I know a lot more about them than I'd like to. So, Jim, uh, if, if you don't mind, you've been working a lot on sort of crowdsourcing tools and techniques to track earmarks, and I hear you have a little bit of show and tell as well. So, you can I do, I do. So, I'll drone for a while. Uh, Steve really does know a lot about earmarks. He's sort of the guru who I turn to when I when I don't know what's going on. Um, I'll share a little bit about the the earmark data collection that I've been working on and how it can be translated into congressional transparency. Uh, but first, I'll say a few things about uh, about the work I do overall. And and first, I want to sort of congratulate Daniel and the Sunlight Foundation for putting together the advisory committee on transparency, um, which is a is a neat thing and it's only going to grow. I think I think that uh, that we're at a special time, a special inflection point, frankly, because um, the transparency movement kind of took off with the beginning of the, of the Obama administration. I put together at Cato a, a, a little uh, policy forum called "Just Give Us the Data" in uh, December of 2008 to sort of signal to my community that transparency is is a win-win across the ideological spectrum and across the political spectrum. I think then everybody agreed that transparency is good. I think still today everybody agrees that transparency is good. 
and I don't see any uh, break in the coalition with a, with a, a few changes of power here and there on Capitol Hill. Uh, I think transparency is going to continue to be regarded by Republicans and Democrats, by conservatives and libertarians and liberals as a good thing. So um, that's good news, and it's a credit to the Sunlight Foundation and plenty of other people um, that, that everybody agrees on this, and it hasn't, uh, hasn't become any, anything like an ideological fight. There haven't been any political splits about transparency. So moving forward from there, I'll, I'll talk about the work, um, the sort of nuts and bolts work on earmark transparency that I've done. <coughs> As Daniel mentioned, I run a site called WashingtonWatch.com. I'm a, I'm a big self-promoter, so I often repeat URLs like WashingtonWatch.com. Thanks. Daniel enjoyed that joke. Anyway, um, last summer, the summer of 2009, actually with a, with a small uh, starter grant from uh, the Sunlight Foundation, I put together a project to try to gather earmark request data. That's as distinct from earmark approve, approval data which is, uh, which is easier, thanks to a few years of, of good habits there. Earmark request data only just, uh, only just uh, became available, and it became available in really, really bad formats. The, uh, the Senate and House Appropriations Committees and Leadership got together and, and um, said, your, your requests have to be publicly available, uh, but went no further than that. And so all the requests were posted on individual member websites in whatever format they, they felt like using. Many and most, frankly, are in HTML, which is fairly useful. A lot are in PDF format, which is a little bit difficult to work with. And, and the worst of the worst are PDF images of paper copies that they had, that they had scanned and then put in. And those are, those are really bad. The worst, to, to try to give you a, a sense of the flavor, the worst of the worst are the ones that come as a chart with a, with a, a series of blocks. Because when you OCR those, all the, all the words from the whole chart sort of collapse together. And so you have address information and description information, uh, dollar amount, everything else, just sort of in a, in a mush that you have to pick apart in order to make into useful, useful data. And I think people here understand the difference between non-useful and useful data. At any rate, I, I put together a contest for, uh, for the public to try to, try to gather these earmarks. And, and it was, Surprisingly successful. I think the offer of um, a fruitcake to the third place uh, winner of, uh, in terms of earmark hunting was what really got people on board. But we gathered over 40,000 earmark requests from, from across the Capitol Hill websites. And that was a delight. It was obviously a delight to see public participation, so much interest out there in the land on it. Up on the screens, you can see um, an example of this is, this is some of the earmarks um, that we put on display on the Washington Watch site. The database is publicly available, so anybody anybody can use it, and you can tool around on there. Um, this is th at the earmarks tab on WashingtonWatch.com to to see where different earmarks are, how much they're for, what data we could gather from those things. So this I think illustrates what you get when you have some transparency. Uh, we we wrenched it out of these uh, obscure documents and produced something that the public can access and produced a I think a, a useful representation of this of this information. Well. Uh, that's great and all, but it wasn't very much fun, and it was it was really hard to do, and it continues to be very hard to gather request data. So, with some other colleagues of mine in the transparency community, we put together a sort of request to Congress and posted on a new site called EarmarkData.org, and you can see it you can see it here on the screen. So, EarmarkData.org is sort of a campaign site, but it's sort of just an inf informational site where you can get a look at the data schema that is. Um, to collect the earmarks in a useful format, we had to come up with what they look like as data. And as you can see up on the page, um, this is not something that the average person is going to read, but it's something that the, the average coder would be able to read and the average data user would be able to read so that we can talk in a common language about what, what the earmarks are. Our hope has been that uh, that whatever appropriate entity in the Congress would start using this schema because it, it's a product of experience. It's open to amendment, of course, too, because there are other people with more experience who could contribute to it. But just generally speaking, this was the sort of uh, placing our order with Congress. We would like to get earmark data that looks like this, uh, that, we can, that we can work with that's obviously in machine-readable in machine readable format so that, uh, so that maps like the one on WashingtonWatch.com can happen so the folks at Sunlight can work with it. Any, any organization can do anything they want with it. And I think what you end up, of course, will be an improved conversation overall, uh, better direct oversight, uh, better public oversight of the overseers in Congress, and so on and so forth. Steve Ellis's job would be easier, 
my job would be easier. And uh, we both really want that. I think we'll do good things for you that way too. And, and this is not hard to do. I think most people know that it is not hard to do this. Um, to, and, and if I were to make a, a, a clean recommendation about what, what to do going forward, um, quite simply, the appropriations committees should make their own lives easier by asking earmark requesters to submit their earmarks online in a format that matches up with that schema. So here again, another display. Um, this, is the, this is the entry form that we asked people to use to enter the earmark data in. An entry form just like that on, on the intranet here on Capitol Hill could be used to make earmark requests. And so the House and Senate Appropriations Committees are probably the best ones to run it, and they'd be the authoritative source. Um, so that when an earmark is requested, that's an online function. That happens online so that the data about that request is av immediately available uh, in a database and the public can see it. A perfectly transparent process and perfectly easy to do, perfectly cheap as well. As a demonstration, Daniel promised you something very exciting and I know you're excited to see this because this contains all the data you need to collect earmarks in these formats. I actually asked, it's literally true that on this uh, thumb drive along with uh, nearly two gigabytes of other stuff is the six and a half megs you need to collect earmark data in an online in, in, online in a format that the public can use. So it's already been done, we've done it, it's really not plug and play, you'd have to, you'd have to, to incorporate something like this into existing systems, but, uh, but it's really easy and it's, and, and it's just a matter of some uh, behavior change on Capitol Hill and the behavior change could start right now with House and Senate Appropriations Committees deciding to do this. I think we'll probably get back to some of the politics of earmarks, but they could line up, I think, very favorably for transparency, depending on maybe what happens tomorrow in the Senate. Um, President Obama has been clear, if not terribly active, uh, in, in pushing for earmark transparency and calling for a, a state-of-the-art uh, earmarks database. I like to think maybe we've produced, produced something like a state-of-the-art, or maybe the state-of-the-art is only as far as we've gotten. But, uh, but we're very close to having earmark, earmark transparency. It's just a matter of the commitment on the part of leaders here on the Hill and uh, down the street. So. Great. Well, thank you very much. So um, we're going to go to questions in just a moment. But since, uh, since I'm uh, sort of running the show, I get to ask the first question because, uh, because it's not fair and life isn't fair. So the question that I want to answer, the what is, what's sort of interesting to me is right now the House is talking a lot about uh, an earmark span. And the question is, let's say on Wednesday that they go and they enact some kind of a moratorium or some kind of a ban. Um, what does this mean for earmark transparency? And would you like to take first crack at that? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, what, what we've understood that uh, the Republicans are likely to adopt is some sort of a rules change or a conference rule that is a moratorium uh, on earmarks that essentially uh, you would assume because they're going to be the majority in the 112th Congress would effectively be a House moratorium on earmarks because it'd be hard to see, um, you know, say it's Chairman Lewis of the Appropriations Committee that he's going to bring a bill to the floor that has a whole bunch of earmarks for Representative Dix uh, and none for him. So I think that uh, it's pretty clear that, that if the majority adopts a moratorium, then it's going to be a moratorium for the entire House. Um, similarly, uh, as, as uh, Jim alluded to over um, the other side of the Capitol, um, tomorrow there'll be a vote uh, among Senate Republicans about doing a moratorium for their conference. It's still not clear exactly how that'll shape out. Shape out. Um, it does look like the, um, uh, the morator pro moratorium forces have uh, a bit of momentum, a little wind behind their back. but. Uh, it's a secret ballot in a closed room, so we all know that uh, uh, politicians have this nifty ability to talk out of both sides of their mouth. So uh, I, you know, I think it's anybody's guess what will exactly happen. But one of the concerns that uh, you, you have, and you can look at the, um, uh, the stimulus as being a, a test case, is there were effectively there really weren't any earmarks in the stimulus. Um, it was just big pots of money that went to various agencies and the programs, but it wasn't earmarked in the traditional sense. 
And so what you did find was that many lawmakers wrote letters to the to uh, the federal agencies. They made phone calls to federal agencies to try to get the money directed back home. So you either have letter marks or uh, phone marks uh, that were being done. And so there are issues around, uh, in some ways, people talk about, particularly among the lobbyists who've been around, or even Mr. Walsh, former Congressman Walsh, about the bad old days, you know, where essentially it was that they would call and, and try to get this funding, and we know even less about why the decisions are being made. Um, just like I'm not going to let the perfect be enemy of the good, I also knew that know that two wrongs don't make a right. So, uh, you know, I mean, earmarking in the way we have it is wrong. So to saying that, well, it's going to be worse if you don't keep ear a bad earmark system uh, doesn't really carry sway with me. I'd rather fight that next fight. Uh, so I think that um, really a lot of that is going to be about um, definitely making sure we don't squeeze the balloon and, 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 and push funding underground. But at the same time, I also recognize that you can't do 9,499 letter marks or phone marks. It's just not possible. And so the volume would go down. Secondly, it's about transparency mechanisms and government spending as a whole. And so it's about knowing better about why the spending decisions are being made. And we're not just about the legislative branch. We're about the executive branch. And we're about the whole federal budget. And so some of it is, is bringing more attention and more scrutiny overall in the budget is the way to move forward rather than just saying, oh, well, you'll be worse off if you, uh, if you have a moratorium or a ban on earmarks. And then lastly, I think that you know, the moratorium, one of, our, one of our reasons why we support that, even though we've never said that you should just completely outright eliminate earmarks. I mean, if you look, we've never said that as an organization because I just don't think it's necessarily going to happen, um, is that we should be moving then towards taking the pause, this break, and the pressure that will build to try to have some sort of resolution to this system to actually then figure out, well, how do we have a merit-based competitive or, or formula systems for awarding our funding? How do we get to a more transparent spending system that then uh, we, people can be comfortable in the fact that the projects are being funded on the basis of merit, not muscle? Obviously, if earmarks went away entirely, earmark transparency would become somewhat moot. Uh, and I think that would be all right with me. Though I, I, I agree with Steve that I don't think that killing off earmarks is the is the number one best thing, the most important thing that can happen. There's, there are some strange sort of existential questions about earmarks because you're right, they, they wouldn't go away. Uh, I think I think what, what uh, this pressure on earmarks is producing is it, I guess it's revealing the fact that earmarks have become such a matter of course that they were being distributed without regard to merit. Um, and the point is to get is to get spending that's based on merit. However, however Congress wants to determine that. Sometimes even even um, even moving money around based on seniority is okay. I think. Um, but uh, but the the practice had gr gone to where earmarks were just being doled out willy nilly or only being used uh, as trades uh, in, in log rolling. So what happens going forward um, really does, I think, turn on the, the vote tomorrow in the, in the Senate Republican conference. If the, if the conference uh, decides not to, to uh, bar itself from, from asking for earmarks in the next year, you've got a very interesting thing because you've got divided Republicans, essentially, between the House and the Senate. A lot of opportunity, frankly, for, for Democrats and the president to, to take advantage of that. I'm not sure exactly how they would. Things go better, I think, for transparency if, if the Senate Republicans agree to not do earmarks. Because then, I think, politically, the Democrats are a little bit on the spot uh, to answer that, um, to, to, to answer that sort of uniform Republican statement. And one way that they can answer it, I think, frankly, is by, is by doing very good transparency, by saying, Hey, we th we're willing to to do, to do earmarking. We think it's good for the country, and we're also willing to be transparent about it. I think that's a, a good step, and it's a, a, probably a politically feasible step um, for for a caucus that apparently wants to con continue with earmarking. So in that in that environment, I think that that uh, Democrats could do the transparency. Republicans could eschew earmarks entirely, while we you know negotiate on what the future of earmarking is. I think overall. Um, earmark transparency is a bit of a camel's nose under the tent for more general transparency in toto. Earmarks are pretty easy. It wasn't, it wasn't no work at all. It was a little bit of work to devise the, the, the schema for the data 
to, to get the data into that format, but it's pretty small potatoes compared to the value of having this kind of data out there. So um, if your marks were to go away, we're going to continue working on making other parts of the budget and spending process transparency, trans transparent so that conversations like this can continue. And again, we move closer and closer to better oversight and more meritorious spending decisions. So, and with that, I'd like to open up for questions if, if folks uh, have questions. Yes, please. Assuming that the, the Democratic conference in the Senate continues as it is, what does that mean, you know, so that the House goes ahead in and enacts a ban. The Senate Republicans have a ban. Uh, you know, the, the legislation, you know, comes from the House, goes to the Senate, the Senate then goes ahead and puts the earmarks uh, back into it. Um, what does the House do? Well, um, I mean, ideally, or not ideally, but supposedly, yeah, the spending uh, legislation originates in the House. In reality, it originates in both chambers. So, I mean, the earmarks are in there, are cooked in from the beginning um, in the Senate. And then, uh, at least this year, I mean, from my understanding of talking to staff, that uh, you had a similar situation where you had the House uh, uh, ban on for-profit earmarks. You had the House Republican moratorium, and then you had all bets are off in the Senate. And uh, the spending bills that they cobbled together to make this potential omnibus for FY11 that they may be considering has earmarks in it. So uh, what you don't know is, is that you know that was with the Democratic uh, having some earmarks, Democratic leadership in the House having some earmarks, and obviously Democratic leadership in the Senate. Uh, you don't know exactly how that will shake out. And I can clearly see an opportunity for the president to triangulate on this issue. I mean, if the Senate Democrats are the only people doing earmarks, I mean, just like uh, Senator McConnell put his uh, political finger to the wind to see which way the wind is blowing, the president could do exactly the same way. And what better way to triangulate and to take a fis make, a, make a fiscal statement to try to show that he can work with the other party than to basically throw his Senate Democrats under the bus. I mean, just takes a page from President Clinton's uh, playbook and does exactly that. So, I, I mean, that to me is what is a logical outcome. And also, I just think generally the pressure is going to be so great um, on the Senate Republicans. They're going to have to do something. They can't just – Senate Democrats, they can't just do business as usual, particularly considering – Senator Reid was an appropriator. Senator Durbin is an appropriator, and so it just the optics just don't don't look good. I think that's a that's probably the best bet for what happens. Um, I'm less inclined to believe that President Obama will throw Senate Democrats under the bus, um, but but their their only way out is to be really really good with this stuff, and that's that's probably to be um, very transparent to do to to. Uh, be able to make a substantive argument that all the earmarks that they're asking for in a, in a House Senate conference, that all those earmarks um, deserve the public support. Um, that's going to be a hard case to make, but I think they might try to make it. Well, I think the, the president actually does have a bit of the, um, the moral high ground on this. I mean, he went through, uh, granted he wasn't in the Senate for very long, but during his relatively short tenure, he went through a whole... Uh, uh, morphing in his position. His first year, he basically followed Senator Durbin's lead. He did earmarks the regular way. The next year, he didn't do any earmarks for for-profits. The year after that, he disclosed all of his earmark requests, which was not um, required at the time. And then, I mean, clearly, he was starting to run for the presidency. The last year, he didn't request any earmarks at all. And so, uh, you know, he went through an evolution, and he can certainly go to them and say, hey, I didn't do this, you know, I, I was able to uh, get elected president, you know, and you have other lawmakers that have been reelected uh, without earmarks. And so I think that there are, um, uh, Senator Feingold was a good example until recently, um, but uh, uh, although his opponent opposed earmarks as well. Uh, but anyway, I think that there are, um, uh, I'm not, it's not going to look as as, as bloody and ugly as thrown under the bus, but in a political, metaphorical sense, I can definitely see that there's a lot of pressure and the optics are just going to be very bad for the Senate Democrats. And considering that they're defending um, a huge number of seats in 2012, they ignore the, sort of the call from the electorate at their political peril. So Mike, you had a question. It can be different ways. Um, the way that it was, uh, uh, Craig Holman at Public Citizen was the one who took the lead on drafting that, um, and uh, 
it was actually there was legislation it was based on i guess there's new jersey um uh, state legislation on contracts that was similar it was sort of uh, campaign contributions for contracts it's set up in that it was uh, uh in, in in what the proposal was for the congressional bill it was uh, an aggregate of five thousand dollars from either agents which would be lobbyists uh PACs, the members of the employees of the of the company uh, over the whole election cycle, that would be uh, that would be the, the the maximum amount of contributions. Um, there's a separate way to look at this that Representative Flake introduced um, legislation earlier this Congress, which essentially um, was kind of was clever in the fact that there already is existing rule that lawmakers have to uh, disclose uh, when they submit their earmarks. They submit a letter that says, "I have neither I nor my spouse have any financial interest in this in this earmark." Or uh, and would be essentially defining campaign contributions to be over a de minimis amount to be a financial interest, and so it's a little more elegant uh, and simple way of doing it than you know several pages of legislation. That's another way to do it, which would be done through the Congress through the rules rather than through uh, legislation. And you know we're pretty open minded about how to how to how to deal with that, but it sounds like it might not be an issue at least not uh, at the at the moment. We'll see. Well, I'm going to ask another question. Um, so, as we're looking at the earmark system, what are the kinds of things that we need to track? What, what you know, we've looked at the ETA, for example, the earmark transparency. Act. What are the the discrete types of items that are useful, or that you found have been useful as you've gone and, and built uh, the system through Washington Watch, or as you've you know you've gone back over the last maybe half decade in building uh, the earmarks database? I think one of the real challenges, and it hasn't been done, and I mean, we haven't done it, and I don't know of anybody else who tracks earmarks who has, is really looking at sort of earmarks as, as, the, as the life cycle of an earmark. You know, there's definitely things that we've seen year and year and year uh, again. And uh, at some point, you know, one of our proposals has always been to uh, have a, uh, a for lack of a better term, term limits for earmarks that, you know, basically you get funded for three or four years and then you've got, you're done. You know, that essentially you either got to walk on your own through the, the budgetary and appropriations process or uh, you, you just, you're, you're cut off. And certainly there are some companies that that's all they've, they've lived in, they, they just live on the earmarks. Um, so I think that some of it that would be very valuable and that just doesn't exist is just knowing the history of these projects and how they're funded and where they started and how much money of total have they gotten, how long till they're finished, you know, and some of these things are projects and uh, th these are all critical bits of information that, for instance, um, if the project is in the president's budget for the Army Corps of Engineers, um, we have that information um, on the budget justification sheet that talks about what is the benefit cost ratio of this project, what is the you know, who's the contractor that's building it, what was uh, some in information about it, even drawings or uh, uh, maps, and then how long is it going to take to complete at what spending level. And uh, none of that information exists for the congressional earmarks that are in the Army Corps of Engineers budget. And so it's some of that type of information that would be incredibly uh, uh, valuable as well. I think that's a, that would be an important crosswalk, a year-over-year -year kind of crosswalk among earmarks. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in marrying up the earmark request data, which I've collected in the past, um, with the earmark approval data, which uh, Taxpayers for Common Sense has, has done such good work with. Um, I've been contacted by political scientists who are saying, Where, how, can I get, how can I get my hands on this because I want to see it? And, and I think they're, they want to see it for good reason because you learn a lot about congressional behavior and, and frankly, you might, it, you might interest a lot of earmark requesters to see uh, who categorically or who based on seniority or location or party or whatever else, who's getting earmarks and who's not getting earmarks. Our members of Congress, I hate to say it here uh, in, in, in the Rayburn building, our members of Congress telling constituents, oh yeah, I'm going to fight to get you that money, and then turning around and not necessarily fighting to get that money. Uh, lots, of, lots to be learned there. Another thing that, should, uh, that must be included in earmark transparency, uh, which is a little obscure but, but essential, are is unique identification of each earmark request and unique identification of each approved earmark uh, by the authoritative source. That would ideally be the Appropriations Committee, but it could be the Secretary of the House, Clerk of the House, um, sorry, Secretary of the Senate, Clerk of the House. Uh, I noted with concern that S3335, is that the, mm -hmm. the yep. Senate, Senate bill, um, didn't specify unique identifiers for these things, but, but uh, everybody should know, I want you all to know, 
that a request and an approved earmark are essentially separate entities that each needs to be uniquely identified. You can then you can then build a bridge between the two, a relationship between the two, but the life cycle of an earmark in a given year isn't request and then it becomes real and then so on and so forth. There's a lot of different requests and, and things like that. Understanding the structure and uniquely identifying each request and each earmark separately would do a lot. And then similar crosswalks between requests and approvals and approvals year over year would, would get to the very interesting information that Steve Ellis would be looking for. So. Right. Well, yeah, because five lawmakers could request the same earmark. So you have five unique uh, requests with one actual earmark. So, I mean, that makes sense. And then actually, um, it does, you know, it's funny you're talking about some of the things, some of the things we have seen in the trending data was that, for instance, um, in FY08, it was pretty, which is the first year we had the disclosure of the lawmakers, we saw pretty predictable uh, numbers. Uh, Representative, late Representative Murtha, uh, Representative Young at the top. And then starting in FY09, all of a sudden, we had uh, Representative Abercrombie, Representative Hirono leaping to the top of our sort of lawmakers who got earmarks by themselves or with others. And what clearly had happened there uh, was, and the same thing happened to some extent, lesser extent, this last year with uh, Representative Gao, is, is that um, they recognized, well, Senator Inouye is getting a ton of earmarks. We're just going to, like, request everything under the sun. They didn't get it in the House bill, but it was in the final bill, so then they, they were able to kind of take credit for some of these projects. And so certainly transparency does create some some things, unintended consequences, which I'm not saying is necessarily bad, but it was one thing that we realized that when we look at how a lawmaker does, when we look at the House, it's our solo number that is the most appropriate. In the Senate, it's our joint number that's the most appropriate to sort of measure the, uh, the, their power and their uh, skill at getting earmarks. And so, I mean, I think that that's something that kind of gets to, uh, uh, you know, one of these odd sort of things that you sort of shaking out as, as, you, as you look through it. Well, earmarks.gov, I mean, it's a new title, but it essentially was omb.earmarks.gov before. It, and so it, um, in its FY10, they actually have in there, I just looked at it today, to be honest, uh, after the president's uh, radio address over the weekend. Uh, and it started um, in the Bush administration, because there's actually FY05 data there as well that they use as a, sort of the baseline, which most people regard as sort of the high watermark for earmarks, either that or FY06, but there was no earmarks in Labor HHS in FY06. Um, so, but, uh, and so it has that, that information there, and, and it is useful. They use a slightly different definition for earmarks. I mean, everybody has, we have a different definition than OMB, than Congress, than the, uh, than uh, um, CGW. And so everybody's slightly different, although we're pretty much, you know, 90 some odd percent the same. Um, they actually generate their data, or at least said they've generated their data in the past by asking the federal agencies to look at their budgets to figure out what do they say is an earmark in their budget. So it's a little bit different way of coming at that same issue than Congress, which is saying, here are all the earmarks. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if the federal agencies are just looking at what's in the bill and writing that down, but they're not necessarily supposed to. They're supposed to come at a different way. I think it's, a, it's, it's valuable information. It's put up in a, a common delimited format, so it's, you know, it's easily downloadable and searchable uh, in, some, in some ways. Um, it, so it, it is valuable to have that. Um, I just talked to a... Um, a reporter today uh, from Fact Check uh, that was looking at um, David Axelrod's comment over the weekend that we cut earmarks in half, uh, for the number of earmarks in half from uh, the high water mark, and I was able to point him to OMP's own website that said they didn't. Um, I mean, they cut them, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to take that away, but it went from like 14,000 down to 9,000, uh, so it wasn't half. Yeah, I'd have to look a little bit more closely into the data, but I think that all that sort of information, uh, and I, I haven't had a chance, would be, yeah, it would be definitely valuable. And that wasn't in there previously, so I think they, they are uh, increasing the, the available information, and that was one of the things they talked about. And I think that'll be something that we, actually I know it'll be something that we'll be using going forward. So I, I haven't, I saw the, uh, or listened to at least the President's radio address, so I, I haven't looked at the 2010 numbers yet. Uh, it would be interesting to see how what they have ties into um, the databases that these guys have assembled to see if it, it follows through in the same kind of way. Um, it's, it would also be sort of interesting, you know, what's going to be in that database? I think it's going to miss a lot of the pieces that we're interested in as well. It's not going to have the requests, for example. It's just going to have the final awards. 
So that piece of the pie is also very useful to see in terms of what people are pushing for and what they're requesting. Um, I think a lot of this fits into a, a broader question, which is budget transparency generally. Um, we saw with the, the recent launch of clear spending, I think it's clearspending.org, but it could be clearspending.com, I, I get those confused, where we found that um, $1.3 trillion, I believe, of the, the money that the, federal, that the government is recording for its budget is, is incorrect, and that you can't actually track through where the money is going and how it's being spent. And earmarks is just a very small piece of a much bigger picture. Um, this was actually the question I was going to ask you, gentlemen, but I guess I'm answering my own question instead. Um, so, so I think that as we look at the congressional process, as we look at the executive process, as we look at it from, from appropriation and authorization to allocation and expenditure, as, as we start to try to piece all of that together, um, you know, earmarks will, will form a useful foundation for that. I mean, because we're seeing, okay, you know, fine, you know, there, let's say there's no earmarks as of, as of Thursday but you can write a letter to the agency, or the president can sort of push things in one direction or another. Or there's a whole host of other ways that you can sort of influence the way block grants are, are being allocated, or you can communicate things in certain kinds of ways. So I don't think, in the earmark context, the earmarks themselves are gonna go away, they're going to morph in a, certain, in a certain aspect, but it does fit ultimately into the question of budget transparency, and being able to figure out what's going where and how, and we are a long way from, from even beginning to go down that path. Yeah, I don't. I don't think anybody is is um, any earmark opponent is is working on earmarks because when they're done getting rid of them, they're done with their job. Um, earmarks are symbolic politically. Um, for me, my the reason why I think they're interesting is because they're the starting point. They're a, they're a um, they're a, a, a bite of of the budget process that you can start start to chew on, and we'll just we'll go on to the next. Uh, the next part of the meal. They're in a moose bouche for the total budget. I think that's actually the right percentage uh, if, if you're talking about a very I'm large stealing meal. that. <laughs> I think um, I want to cut off your microphone now. Um, so I'm that's been uh, so what is one the, too many bad jokes. So what is the next step? What's the, what's the next issue? Do we know yet? Well, it might be to, it, it might be to try to, to tackle budget transparency again. I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of people working on a lot of parts of, of that question there's a lot of I think I think actually your marks are tougher in a way because because at least as far as requests go you've got all this stuff in all these bad formats but we know that the budget process at OMB is in good formats it's a it's a I think the next project is probably to either get that open or reverse engineer the max database and start to st start to push that the, the, the whole thing so so um, this has been, I think earmarks are pretty hard because of the, of the weird definitions and the weird um, formats the data is in. If we do the same thing with overall budget transparency, that's a much, much larger project, but it's already in, I think, a better state. It's in a, um, we'll, we'll move forward faster with that, I suspect. I mean, clearly there's a, I mean, the issue that you found, whether you're talking about um, usaspending.gov or you're talking about uh, recovery.gov, um, part of the challenge is, is that they're very, uh, they're slaves to the data. And, you know, you have bad data, you have bad information. And so, in, you know, fads and other areas, you have incredibly bad data. And, you know, we saw that when people entered, you know, that the funding was being done in the rec under the Recovery Act and the, and the stimulus in, in the 50th Congressional District of Rhode Island. You know, and so uh, you, you definitely, those are some of these issues that are going to be very hard to tackle but are very important to tackle. And there's lots of things about, you know, our federal government and how we spend the money. We have absolutely no clue how we're actually spending the money, at least not in any kind of larger sense. And so those are going to be clearly things that we want to tackle. I mean, one of the issues that was about earmarks, though, that always got our attention is just the sort of pay to play and the corrupting influence of earmarks and the log rolling influence of earmarks. And those are things that will be a little bit more removed. I mean, it's also, I recognize that Duke Cunningham, uh, a lot of his stuff wasn't about earmarks, it was about contracts. And he was browbeating contracting officers over at DOD to get the monies, for, get, the, get the money for MZM and other companies um, that were giving him a Louis XIV commode and things like that. So, and with that, and uh, seeing no further questions, I'd like to thank our guests very much. Uh, Steve Ellis, Jim Harper, appreciate it. And thank you all for coming out. If you have any questions, of course, 
will be around afterward. Thank you again. Sure. And uh, check out our, uh, uh, our databases are all up at www.taxpayer.net. WashingtonWatch.com. Earmarkdata.org. Taxpayer.net. <laughs>